everyone. And the, the question that we have today for this showcase with Bernardo Castrup is, uh, is reality all in your head? That's, that's what we called it kind of half jokingly, but, but also not because we're going to be talking about metaphysical idealism, which we'll go into in a moment. And uh, Bernardo Castrup is a, a philosopher and he's also a computer scientist. And he's kind of, you know, well known now for going against the grain of you know, arguably modern philosophy in general by arguing for metaphysical idealism. And that's the notion that reality is, is essentially a mental phenomena. Um, of course, much more to it that Bernardo will take us through. But what I find really interesting, or one of the things I find interesting about Bernardo and his work is that he's a philosopher, he's got a PhD in philosophy, but he's also got a PhD in computer science. And so he really moves in the worlds of science and technology. He's worked for CERN, and also the Phillips Research Laboratories. So, uh, you know, so Bernardo's really been at the kind of the cutting edge of physics, which I think is really interesting. And um, we've also explored on the channel um, the, the issues with uh, scientific materialism and the materialist worldview and the way it kind of strips out meaning from the world. And so I'm really curious to, to delve into this a bit more. And Bernardo, firstly, thanks for joining us. My pleasure to be here, Alexander. And maybe a, a really good place to start would be just laying out like what is metaphysical idealism and, and wh why does it uh, matter? You, you put it correctly. It is the notion that the reality is essentially mental or experiential, that the concept of matter under our mainstream physicalist metaphysics uh, is a theoretical abstraction that we don't need to have. We don't need to postulate a substance that is completely outside and independent uh, of experience uh, to make sense of the facts. So idealism says everything is experiential, everything is mental, but not in your mind alone, not in my mind alone. It postulates a sort of uh, a transpersonal, spatially unbound field of subjectivity underlying nature. And also interesting would be to, to hear your thoughts on, so why is idealism not been you know, the most popular branch of philosophy? And, and what is materialism? What's on the, the other side of it? Okay, so materialism, technically, technically called mainstream physicalism, is the notion that, okay, there is a world out there beyond our minds, but that, that world is not experiential at all. It is material, but this material, uh, the way they use the word, has a strict conceptual definition. Matter is something that can be exhaustively described through numbers, through quantities. It does not have any qualities. It doesn't have, have color. It doesn't have sound. It doesn't have flavor. Uh, it's purely quantitative. And because we are part of that, that world, we too are purely quantitative beings. And the entire world of qualities that constitutes our inner reality or the world that we can experience, that is supposed to be generated in some way in some unspecified way by your brain inside your head. So under mainstream physicalism, the world of colors around you, sounds, flavors, and smells, that world is entirely within your head. What is really outside has no color, has no flavor, has no scent. You cannot visualize it because it has no qualities. Uh, the best you can do is to picture it as a sort of set of mathematical equations floating <laughs> in the void. So that's physicalism. Um, why is idealism not mainstream today? Well, there has been a point in history in which it was mainstream. Uh, back to the axial age, it was mainstream. Uh, back in the 19th century in Europe, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, it was mainstream. German idealism was mainstream in the continent. Um, today, it is not because, and that's my own view of things, uh, physicalism played a very convenient political role in the beginning of science to carve out a space for scientists to do that uh, their work without being burned at the stake by the church. So it created a, a world of abstractions that the church didn't care about, because if you tell the church, well, we are busy with a world that is not in the psyche, in other words, it, it's not mental, it's not... Uh, um, soul, psyche is the Greek word for soul as well, not only mind. The church was like, okay, <laughs> by all means, go ahead and do that. Um, and, and since then, 
uh, it has gathered a lot of momentum. And today we don't really examine the basic premises and assumptions of physicalism. We inherit that from the culture. There is an entire stigma of values in the culture that makes it very inconvenient for you to go against that idea. Um, so it, it has become the mainstream. Uh, I would say not on the basis of reason and evidence, but on the basis of a sort of culturally manufactured sense of plausibility that we inherited from history and which originated largely for political reasons. Yeah, it would be really good to, to dive into that in a little bit more detail. Just, you know, in terms of where we are um, in the West, perhaps, in our kind of philosophical journey um, and thinking, how, do you see it changing now? Do you see us moving? I mean, certainly it's something we cover on the channel a lot, but I don't know if we're also in a bubble. But do you see a move away from physicalism and materialism towards taking idealism uh, more seriously? I think there is increasing openness. It's very slow. That's the, the good news. There is increasing openness. The bad news is that we are starting from a starting point that is worse than most people, I think, realize how politically ingrained this set of premises and assumptions is in materialism. A lot of uh, very outspoken uh, militant materialists today do not understand materialism. Jerry Coyne is a big example. You know, uh, half of what he writes contradicts materialism, but he does that overtly in defense of, of physicalism or materialism. So uh, the starting point is pretty bad. There is, there is a huge mountain to climb, but progress is being made. I mean, Scientific American has published 12 essays, articles from me. Uh, in, in each one of them, I contradict physicalism and I endorse uh, idealism. Could you imagine that happening 20 years ago? I don't think so. And what do your colleagues, uh, you know, at somewhere like CERN or Philips Research Labs, like, what, what do they make of, of your, uh, your philosophy and, and your work? Uh, my recent colleagues uh, uh, tend to be puzzled, but not uh, committal, uh, because, you know, there is a big stimergy, stigmergy uh, in place here. It can hurt you to express even doubt about uh, uh, mainstream physicalism. Um, core, hardcore scientists, people who are actually doing science and not talking about it on TV, um, for them, it is not as important whether physicalism is right or not as most people tend to think, because science studies the behavior of nature. That's what experiment tells you about how nature behaves given a set of starting circumstances. Um, so for them, what nature is, is not that relevant professionally. At a personal level, of course, they have their views. It's important for them personally, but professionally we can, study, model, and predict the behavior of nature, regardless of what nature intrinsically is, whether it's material, whether it's mental, we can pin down how it behaves. And that's what we call science, is the study of the behavior of nature. Um, but, you know, I, I, I know where you're trying to go with these questions. Again, even um, if I take a sample of my personal acquaintances, uh, I would think that, uh, people who would have been um, not only skeptical, but who would have made fun of alternatives to materialism uh, several years ago, today they are at least puzzled. So uh, there is a growing awareness that one, materialism doesn't work. You know, that's a hard problem of consciousness, a few other problems around it. And also a growing awareness that not all alternatives to materialism are new age flaky woo woo. <laughs> there is, there are other things uh, being discussed. Yeah, that that actually leads uh, to to another question I wanted to ask. You know, in in popular culture and particularly in the new age, there there has been a, a real. Um, move towards using quantum physics and using the the impact of the you know the observer on reality to um, to justify all sorts of stuff. And I really was curious to, when, in preparation for this to get your thoughts on that. You know, because I know that you you've you know you worked in that area as well. So like, what what does what does what we're learning about quantum physics actually um, imply about uh, physicalism or or about uh, idealism? If you look at the, the, the theoretical predictions of quantum physics, uh, the predictions it makes are not compatible with 
the the idea that uh, physicality has standalone existence that the physical world is the bottom level it, it is the thing in itself it is there and it has its properties regardless of whether we are looking at it measuring it or not the predictions contradict this and we have known that for almost a century but for many decades we thought well those predictions will turn out to be wrong quantum physics will turn out to be incomplete there will be hidden variables that uh, will just reconcile quantum physics with the notion that the physical world is real. In other words, it has standalone reality. It's not just a superficial appearance of something else non-physical. Um, but the technology to, to prove whether quantum theory was in fact correct or incomplete has been around only in you know, tentative terms uh, since the late 1970s. And then a series of experiments began. Um, the first big experiments were the experiments done by Alain Aspect and his team in France. And then there were fantastic experiments done in Switzerland in 98, Austria as well in 98, uh, a, a groundbreaking experiment done in 2007, another in 2010. So the whole list, there was one in the Netherlands where I am in 2015. And each of these experiments refined the results of the original. Why do we do, did we do that? Because the original results were quantum physics is correct. Physicality has no standalone reality, but we can't, we can't take that, right? <laughs> we have a, a long history and a lot of momentum uh, of you know, metaphysical materialism. We don't want to give that up so easily. So more and more sophisticated experiments have been done, closing all kinds of implausible loopholes, but implausible as they may have been, they were closed. And it culminated in 2015, arguably maybe 2018, in which case all loopholes were closed and the results confirmed. Quantum physics was correct. The physical world has no standalone reality. It is a superficial appearance of something else deeper and by definition non-physical because it doesn't have any of the physical properties we call observables. The observables come into existence upon measurement, upon observation. Whatever was there before measurement is by definition not physical. So that's the state of play. The only alternative to what I just said that is still compatible with the experimental results we have on the table today, 40 years of increasingly refined laboratory results that systematically confirmed one another, the only alternative interpretation is to postulate that there are a practical infinity of new real physical universes popping into existence every infinitesimal fraction of a second for no reason out of nowhere and for which we have precisely zero empirical evidence. Now you take your pick, either this that I just said or, hey, it turns out the physical world is not the bottom level of nature. It's an onion. There is a layer below. That layer below is what has standalone existence, but it's not physical. We don't know what it is. It's not physical. Physicality is just how it presents itself to observation. So this is a really interesting area that I think is very difficult for, certainly difficult for me to conceive, even though I've also had experiences which really uh, push me towards uh, having seen reality in that way. But I'm remembering my undergraduate philosophy, probably like the first term, and the, there was a response, and I've forgotten who, I'm sure you, you, it might ring a bell, the response of one philosopher to, I think, George Berkeley, who was a famous idealist, uh, when he went and he kicked a stone and yeah, he said, yeah. well, what, what was that? So what, okay, so if, if reality isn't a physical phenomenon, ultimately, and there's something else going on underneath, what happens when I like pick up a stone what what is going on in that case <laughs> so that was the criticism of poet Sam, samuel johnson against barclay he, uh, he was asked uh, uh, how do you disprove barclay's theory because it seems to not be possible to disprove it and then he kicked the stone and said i disprove it thus and then kicked a stone uh, he is appealing or he was appealing to the solidity to the concreteness of the stone to prove that the world cannot be mental it has to be something else but, uh, you know, think about it, solidity, concreteness, these are mental qualities. If you kick the stone and it hurts your toes, that hurt is mental. It feels like something to be in pain. That is mental. Concreteness is mental. If a stone is heavy, that heaviness you feel is mental. What is non-mental is just a number, X kilos, but that's pure abstraction. 
Um, so Samuel Johnson did nothing with that argument. That argument, if anything, confirms idealism uh, <laughs> and disproves uh, <laughs> because it highlights the primacy of experiential qualities. That's what Samuel, Samuel Johnson actually did. He highlighted that experiential qualities are what we actually have at the end of the day. So to say that the world is intrinsically or essentially mental doesn't mean that it's cloudy and hazy. No, it means that it's re really there. <laughs> you know, it's the real reality. Uh, what idealism says is that this world of qualities around you actually is not inside your head. The latter is what physicalism says. This world of colors around you, it's all inside your head, man. What's up there is pure abstraction. Idealism would say, no, no, no. These qualities do not exist inside your head. It's your head that is in the mental world, not the other way around. That seems like a, a nice seg segue into um, another point that comes up a lot in this discussion, which is around the role of the brain and, and consciousness and whether the brain is a, uh, a generator of consciousness, like, like would be the argument in a, in a kind of materialist paradigm, or the receiver of consciousness. And I would be curious to hear your, your thoughts on, on that quite like simplified version of the argument. But I think, what, what is the brain's role in all of this? Look, there is no denying that there is a tight correlation between patterns of brain activity and inner experience. It would be not only naive, it would be stupid uh, to deny that. It's an observation we know holds. Um, the transmitter receiver metaphor may be useful, but I don't think it's ultimately correct because it's an appeal to dualism. There is mind or consciousness, and then there is the radio that receives it. But that radio cannot be made of consciousness. Otherwise, how does it receive it? How does it filter it? Have you ever seen a coffee filter made of coffee? Um, so ultimately, it, uh, it uh, fails. I think what we call the brain and its activity is what inner experience looks like from a certain perspective. In other words, from an outside perspective, I would postulate that living beings are sort of dissociated psychic complexes, dissociated alters of a transpersonal field of subjectivity. So what the brain is, is what the mental activity within an alter looks like from across its dissociative boundary. That's all there is to it. Now, what I'm saying is that the brain is the image of inner mentation. It, the brain is not what causes it. It's what it looks like. And of course, the image of a phenomenon correlates with the phenomenon it is, a, it is an image of, right? Of course it correlates. There will be a near perfect correlation. And that's what indeed we find that uh, the brain correlates very well with inner experience. Great, it's what experience looks like from across a dissociative boundary. Yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting. And, and what do you think are the implications of um, idealism playing more of a fundamental role in in culture? And and what what would it bring us? You know, like we, we know what a materialist driven world looks like because we live in it, and it's pretty much all we know. Like you said before, we've uh, we've inherited that kind of DNA. Um, what what's what would be your hope for uh, you know a, a world that that uh, starts to move more towards an idealist perspective. If it is, if idealism is really understood and internalized, such that people look upon the world through those new lenses, it will literally change everything. Let me try to give you a sense of why. For an analytic idealist such as me, what we call the physical world is merely the result of measurement and op or observation. Now, let me try to explain this with a metaphor. Evolution has not given us a transparent window into the world that wouldn't work. We wouldn't survive if that were the case. And there are very, very rigorous technical arguments about this. I can point people to, to those. But trust me, if we had a transparent window to see the world as it really is, we would literally die. We would dissolve into an entropic soup. We, we would be too confused to compete uh, in our ecosystem. So what evolution has given us was a dashboard of dials. So imagine that you're inside an airplane and you have all those dials in the instrument panel in front of you. You can fly safely by instruments alone. People, people do this every day. Um, but they can also look across the, 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 the transparent windscreen. Now, evolution did not give us the windscreen. All it has given us is the dials. What shows up in the dials is what we call the physical world. The dials are uh, the, the screen of perception. 
So every, everything you see around you right now is not the world as it really is. It is how it's being measured through your dashboard of dials, through your instrument panel. You are surrounded by an instrument panel. That's what evolution has given you. Nothing else would work to, to help us survive. So if you understand the world this way, then you realize that the physical world is not the end of the story. It is not its own meaning. It's just like the dashboard. Reality is right behind it. You can't see it directly. You can only make inferences about it based on the dashboard. But there is a whole world out there outside that aircraft uh, that, that you cannot see directly. So if you're reading low air pressure, high air humidity, high wind speed on the dashboard, maybe there is a beautiful storm outside, lightning, you know, all kinds of rain, all kinds of beautiful patterns, amazing stuff. And it's right on the other side of the dashboard, but you cannot see it directly. As an idealist, this is how it relates to, to, the, to the world. The world as it really is, is not physicality. Physicality is my dashboard. So I'm always intuiting that extra dimension of depth, mystery, and meaning that is right under my nose, right behind my dashboard. So my world has a totally new extra dimension than the world I had 20 years ago. It's invested in meaning. Another big difference is, look, if we are dissociated processes of a mind at large underlying our nature, then our bodies are what dissociation looks like. It's the extrinsic appearance of dissociation on the dashboard of dials that we call the physical world. But what we are in and of ourselves, as opposed to how we appear on the dashboard, is pure mentation, dissociative mentation. Our thoughts, our emotions, our insights, our feelings. Um, if life is then dissociative mentation, death is the end of the dissociation. Because the body is what dissociation looks like. When you die, the body dissolves, so dissociation dissolves. And that means that your subjectivity doesn't die. It's reintegrated into a broader context. There is an enrichment of consciousness as opposed to the end of consciousness. I mean, I could, I could speak for a whole day about the implications of analytic idealism if that theory is actually internalized and doesn't stay just conceptual in the head. Yeah. And I mean, living out the ideas is, is something that's pr pretty core to what we've been doing at Rebel Wisdom. So, I mean, it's a, it's a fast, I mean, would certainly like to stay on this track for a little bit. Um, you know, what one thing that um, springs up for me is that obviously there are deep correlations with um, Eastern traditions and non-dualism here. It might be interesting to talk about that. I mean, do you consider yourself a a non-dualist in, in spirit or, you know, what how, has this led you to a particular um, spiritual perspective, you know, how would you describe your, your outlook? I don't come at it from the perspective of uh, introspection, meditation, prayer, spiritual insight, enlightenment. I am, I am the antithesis of an enlightened being. <laughs> I suffer from a lot of anxiety. I can be difficult to put up with. So, um, I, and I'm, I'm certainly not a spiritual, spiritual teacher. I come at it from a hard-nosed intellectual perspective. I, I, although I know that the values I'm going to describe right now are limited because they don't cover the whole spectrum of human psychic functions. But I, I espouse the post-enlightenment values. Uh, for me, if the key things to decide whether something's true or not is, is the hypothesis coherent? Is it uh, internally consistent from a logical perspective? Is it conceptually parsimonious? In other words, simple. Uh, is it empirically adequate? Does it explain the stuff of nature? It, does it have explanatory power? Does it make sense of things? So I came at analytic idealism by looking at the evidence, looking at the reasoning, uh, avoiding the, the miles, the, 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 the minds on the road, like the hard problem of consciousness, the subject combination problem, and trying to figure out, can we arrive at a coherent, internally consistent, explanatorily powerful theory of reality based on what we know today? And my conclusion was we absolutely can. And now I'm busy sharing the conclusion I arrived at, explaining the theory. I just finished producing a six hour long, six hour plus uh, long video course uh, on analytic idealism and trying to explain that to people. It's all available online for free, by the way. Um, so I don't come at it from that spiritual perspective. T to be very frank with you, when I was younger, still today a little bit, it's still my shadow. Um, 
things that sounded very spiritual uh, sort of annoyed me. It's like, oh, come on. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, it sound, I, I don't know. It, it, it's my shadow side. But as an adult, I'm 46 years old. Uh, I, I, you know, I know better now than to just surrender to my <laughs> inclinations, my emotional inclinations. I'm a little bit more objective than that. So today I would be able to say, what I'm putting forward seems to be entirely consistent with non-dualism. Sometimes I read what some of these non-duality teachers say, and, and it strikes me, about, yeah, oh yeah, that's it, the guy knows, you know, he's been there. There is this Indian guru, Nisargadatta Maharaj, who lived in the 20th century. He had two years of school education. In other words, he had no education at all. He sold cigarettes on the street. And the stuff he says sometimes just floors me. It's like, darn, it took me two darn PhDs to wrap my head around this stuff. And that guy just casually just says it as if it were obvious, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable saying that um, nothing that I'm putting, putting forward when it comes to the conclusions, not to the, not to the argumentation. I think the argumentation is always unique, but the conclusions are not new at all. They have been around for three and a half thousand years at least. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for that. And, the, you know, there's someone just mentioned something in the chat, which I'm, I'm grateful for. Hughes has just mentioned that it sounds as well a bit like simulation theory, which is some, which is kind of one of the latest iterations uh, in some ways that's come up. I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. This, this concept that has been popularized by, I think, Elon Musk and others that the, the universe is a simulation. So how, how does that um, kind of popular idea tie in? I don't know what people mean when they say that. I can, I can come up with 10 interpretations of this that are complete nonsense, stupid. Uh, I can come up with one interpretation that may make sense. So if what they mean by it is that reality is not what it seems to be, that it's simulated in that sense, that it's not what it seems to be, it's not physical, then I would say, yeah, okay, that's helpful because no, we don't have a transparent window to see the world. We only have the dashboard. So reality looks like it is the dashboard, but it's not. Reality is what is being measured by the dashboard and is on the other side of it and to which we do not have direct access. So can you say that the dashboard is a simulation of the world as it is in itself? If you can, then okay, we can say it's a simulation. But if what you mean by this is that there is some kind of hypercomputer created by another material civilization and they come, came up with a game and we are the characters in the game and they cracked how to produce consciousness through computation in silicon. I would say this is beyond stupid. It's, it's the kind of stupidity that it becomes extremely dangerous because it is suffixed by the letters PhD. And, and, and this is nuclear powered stupidity. It can decimate a culture. So I consider it's very dangerous. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of with you on that. I, I think the it, it just a massive violation of Occam's razor, if nothing else, to just kind of suddenly postulate. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't solve any problem. If the problem is we don't know how to make sense of consciousness in terms of uh, physicalist premises, then by postulating simulation, you just postpone the problem. Because you know, now the aliens figured out how to create consciousness and they know what consciousness is, but we still don't know. So you've achieved absolutely nothing. All you did was to display your theoretical gullibility, your, your, your ability to completely divorce yourself from our natural sense of plausibility and spill nonsense because it somehow satisfies your religious impulse, which has been repressed because you espouse materialism, or physicalism. <laughs> so that has to come out some other way. And we call that now the religion of singularitarianism or uploading your consciousness to Silicon and living forever and being taken care of, of by a super powerful God uh, that is in fact an AI produced through uh, uh, the singularity. That's the new religion. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I agree. And um, actually, a nice, a nice um, joiner there to another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, talking about the suppression of the religious impulse. I know you're also interested in Carl Jung, um, and we we also share an interest in in the work of Peter Kingsley. I know who who has been very influential on my thinking as well. Um, wh why Jung? It seems like a kind of um, you know from well, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. You know, just to, to, to get a get a sense from you how you got interested in Jung and how it applies to what we're talking about here. 
oh, that comes from very early. I think I was 13 or 14 and I was on holidays in the mountains and, uh, you know, sort of doing reconnaissance in the village <laughs> where I was. And I stumbled upon a bookshop and it had this book, the I Ching, in display. And I and had a curious cover. So, you know, like a teenager, just open it and browse it for a moment. And uh, my first impulse was, ah, this is nonsense. But then there was this foreword by one Carl Gustav Jung, which I started reading. And, and I thought, well, so far, no nonsense. This guy seems to be rational, you know, and he's creating a sort of space of plausibility for what I would have regarded as a silly oracle um, in a very reasonable, you know, self-consistent way. So since then, I have read Jung's collect collected works yeah, a few times over, more than twice. Um, and, and he has been more influential in my thinking than I think I know, because it has started so early that you can't even evaluate how influential the person has been. Um, I maintain that Jung was an idealist. He was not a, a, an overt idealist because he wanted to preserve his image as a neutral psychologist. If he would endorse a philosophy, a particular metaphysical point of view, then people would question his neutrality as a psychologist. And he was very aware of it. Having said that, uh, if you look at his broad work, including the letters he wrote to Father White and other people and his discussions with uh, Nobel winning physicist uh, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, if, you, if you look at all that, I mean, he's, he feels free to say what his philosophical positions are in those letters. Sometimes even in his technical work, his lips, you know, like a Freudian slip. And then he makes a metaphysical statement, very powerful in the middle of a psychological discourse. So he, he clearly was an idealist. I think what Jung called the collective unconscious, this creative matrix of being from which the psyche emerges, from which consciousness emerges, is the same matrix of the so-called material world out there. The material world also organizes itself according to the patterns and regularities that Jung called the archetypes. That's why we have synchronicities, coincidences of events in the physical world, coincidences with meaning. So I think for Jung, the collective unconscious is the bottom level of reality, and it expresses itself in two ways. Through dreams, which are autonomous images we experience but can't control, and through the physical world around us, which are autonomous images we experience but can't control. <laughs> you see the point? So uh, for Jung, we are sort of shoots that uh, pop out in spring out of the root system of reality, which is the collective unconscious. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really lovely way to, to, describe, to describe it. I love that image. Um, and th this sense, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the concept of emergence uh, on the channel as well. And, and this is something I think people are increasingly interested in, this, this quality of something emerging from a system. And it'd be interesting to hear, hear your thoughts on, on emergence and, and kind of how it, how it relates to, to idealism, to, um, yeah, is, is that a quality of the universe? You know, you know the, we zoom out a little bit is, 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 you know, what is the, as you see it, the creative mesh of the universe and how does it work? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> it's a very dangerous concept because it can, use, it can be used for tremendous good tremendous insight, new layers of understanding, and it can also be used to give legitimacy to nonsense, to hide the untenability of an idea. Um, David Chalmers, uh, he classified two types of emergence, what he called weak emergence and, and, and strong emergence. Now, what is emergence in, in general? Emergence is when the properties of a system are not easily derivable from the properties of the components of the system. For instance, the wetness of water is not obvious if you look at the properties of uh, 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 hydrogen and oxygen atoms. But when they combine in a molecule and you add enough molecules together, then wetness comes. So it is difficult to deduce wetness from the properties of hydrogen and oxygen. But it is not impossible in principle. As a matter of fact, if you have a, a, a computer simulation of atoms and molecules uh, and you feed this simulation with everything we know about oxygen and hydrogen atoms, the simulation can derive wetness for you and can predict, okay, the result here will be something that is wet. So 
weak emergence is when a higher level property is difficult to deduce from the low level properties, the constituent, constituent properties. And this is very useful. It's important for us to know that that's how nature is playing out. That's how complexity arises from simplicity. Look, a, a fractal, for instance, it's tremendously complex, isn't it? Or a cellular automaton, tremendously complex. But all that complexity arise, arises from very, very simple rules. So understanding the emergency of complexity from simple rules is, is very important for us to understand the reality, for us to understand that this seeming unlimited complexity of the world probably is just the emergent result of something very simple at the root level of nature, the void, as the Buddhists call it. Everything arises out of the void. Well, how can such complexity arise out of nothing? Well, if you understand weak emergence, if you have seen it at work, uh, 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 then you have a, an intuition for that. Now, the problem is that the same concept, complex uh, uh, emergence, is now used to get nonsensical metaphysics a free pass. For instance, the physicalists or the materialists, they will now say, well, consciousness is an emergent property of matter. We don't know how that emergence happens, uh, but it's just that. So one day we will figure that out. So that's what that's how they defend their approach because the alternative is to say well the hard problem of consciousness has reduced physicalism to absurdity we have to track our steps back and start over in a different direction because the hard problem is not a problem it's a reduction to absurdity of physicalism it tells you puts in your face why physicalism cannot work it is impossible to deduce the qualities of experience from purely quantitative matter these are incommensurable domains but the physicalist then says, oh, but there is emergence. And then they use this concept of strong emergence, which instead of saying that the emergent properties are difficult to deduce from the low level components, they say the emergent properties cannot be deduced from the low level components. They just pop into existence. If it's complex enough, you know, one neuron is not conscious, two also not, 10 not, 3000, probably not, but one trillion, yeah, then it's conscious. But I mean, wait, what kind of magic happens <laughs> in between? <laughs> you know what I mean? So now they just label that magical step, oh, strong emergence. And they pretend that that's a solution. So strong emergence is at best an appeal to a complete unknown. And at worst, and probably that's the reality, it's an appeal to magic. When you do not know how to defend your theory, you appeal to strong emergency, the emergence. And that's unfortunately what's happening most often today. Yeah, it's great, thank you. I mean, it reminds me of the, the quote, I think Terence McKenna used to mention it, uh, of science of just give us one miracle and we'll explain the rest. So with the Big Bang, you know, it's starting at that point. So um, we're gonna have a really short breakout just so that everyone, we have a, a, a everyone has a chance to just have a chat. Um, see what's coming up and um, then we'll come back and, and open the Q&A. And if Bernardo, if you just ignore the, the invite thing. Um, and so no timing this time, everyone, just um, kind of open conversation. I'll let you know when there's a, a couple of minutes left uh, before we come back. So rooms are open. Yeah, so wanted to open it up for uh, a bit of a Q&A. And uh, I was going to ask uh, Matt, Matt Siegel, who was our, our guest yesterday in our Monday session, and uh, also a philosopher. Um, Matt, you asked a question in the chat about uh, Whitehead. Thought it might be uh, nice to ask in person. Sure. Thanks, Ali. And uh, hey, Bernardo. Hey, Matt. Um, <clears throat> So, gosh, how to summarize a, a simple enough question. Um, you know, so I'm a Whitehead scholar, right? And um, while I haven't read your books yet, I've been um, really soaking in some of your recent dialogues, particularly with uh, John Bervakey. And um, I wonder if you could speak a bit to uh, how you relate your own um, articulation of analytic idealism to the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. Um, sometimes he's construed as a panpsychist, but the shoe pinches there a bit. Uh, other times he's 
lumped in with the idealists. And I just wonder if he's influenced your thought at all and how you relate to his work, if at all. So I'll just leave it there. Yeah. He didn't influence me because I didn't know his work um, in the early days. Um, I am not a good person to ask about Whitehead because I don't understand uh, Whitehead. There are two philosophers and two systems that I have a very hard time wrapping my head around in a way that I can pin down what these people meant without ambiguity. It, it, it's very important for me that even if the writer or the philosopher seems to contradict himself while writing, I need to understand in which sense he's actually not contradicting himself. I need to find out the unambiguous meaning behind the loosely written words, if you know what I mean. Uh, uh, Jung seems to contradict himself all over, but I'm satisfied that I know what he meant and what he meant is pretty clean and unambiguous. Uh, Schopenhauer the same. I don't think he really contradicts himself, but he's perceived as contradicting himself. But I can, I think I can discern without ambiguity what he meant. I cannot do that with Whitehead and Hegel. These two guys, uh, uh, Hegel is a master in obscurantism. I just, I mean, I, I even have a beef against Hegel because it's like he, he did it on purpose. He, he wrote it in that peculiarly obscurantist way on purpose. There was no need to write like that. I don't know what he was trying to achieve. Um, so I don't understand what he meant. I only understand certain general lines, like Hegel brought the idea of evolution into Western thought. As Nietzsche said, arguably without Hegel, there would have been no Darwin. Um, so yeah, kudos to Hegel for that. Kudos to Hegel for this idea that society itself has a telos. The idea of a telos, I think it's important as well, has, has grown in Western philosophy quite a bit. But I do not discern without ambiguity what absolute idealism is. Uh, and I do not discern without ambiguity what process philosophy is. Uh, when I think I understand what he's trying to say, no, he says the opposite and I go, oh, darn, it's like he's trying to eat the cake and have it too. So I'm totally open to the possibility that this just reflects my own intellectual limits, my own stupidity. I can't understand the guy. But whatever the reason might be, I'm not a good person to ask about um, Whitehead because I, I don't know what he means. You certainly know a lot better than I do, uh, Matt. Well, uh, it'd be great to talk about it one day. Uh, I appreciate <laughs> your answer. And, uh, you know, let me just say about Hegel, I think he's often given credit for things that while he maybe did help to systematize as incomprehensible as his, his system may be, uh, it was really people like Herder and Goethe and Schelling, who I think made evolution um, you know, a topic of discussion among in, in the West and sort of set the stage for Darwin and Hegel came later uh, and kind of gets credit for everything, but I don't know that he really deserves all of it. So. Well, it all happened in Weimar in the early 19th century, right? It was all a club of gentlemen there, except for Schelling. No, even Schelling. Yeah, even Schelling, late, late 18th century, yeah. Yes, yes. And, and Jena also, Jena, <laughs> University of Jena. But anyways, thanks for your, your answer, Bernardo. You're welcome. Yes, guys. It used to happen in coffee shops, and now it happens in Zoom rooms. So uh, <laughs> how times have changed. Uh, thanks, Matt, and good to see you. Um, uh, David Swedlow, uh, great to hear from you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I also have enjoyed the conversations with John Verveke. Um, Bernardo, I really appreciated that. Uh, one thing that I noticed is the tension at the beginning sort of resolved um, to seem like um, part of what's happening is below the level of language. So that makes it challenging. And I think that may be part of the issue in talking about this, but I'm curious, like you've said something that really sparked my interest. If we're used to thinking from a materialist, materialist frame and we're thinking, kind of working with the gross, um, gross outer layer of things, we're kind of dealing with the, the just the basis you kind know, of banging rocks kind of mode of dealing with things. We're not really dealing with the essential matter, uh, the essential things inside of it, what it's like to be something below the level of people or animals, things that we can see that have a behavior. Is it possible that if we do get more into an idealist frame of mind that we'll learn to actually interact with effectively the mind or, or consciousness of atoms, planets, galaxies and stuff? Do you imagine that we'll actually interact 
um, more with the internal essences of things rather than simply with the external um, gross layer. We have never done anything else because the only thing that exists is the essence, what we call matter is a representation, an appearance, uh, um, a measurement of something. So we've never done anything other than to interact and relate to things as they are in themselves. It's just that they appear to us in an encoded inferential way because otherwise there would be no upper cap on the dispersion of our internal states and we would dissolve into an entropic soup or we would be overwhelmed by too much information and we wouldn't be able to compete in our ecosystem and evolution would have driven us to extinction. So we've never done anything else because these essence that you're referring to is all there is. It's you, it's the world, it's the screen in front of you. The problem is the narratives we place around it. Like you were talking about matter even the word matter, you know, look at the etiology of the word. It comes from matter, mother, comes from matrix, that which gives rise to. Uh, no, there, there is a, a metaphysical prejudice built right into that word. Uh, word. Um, I lost my train of thought by making this uh, <laughs> side comment. Uh, let me try to regain it. What we call matter, even the way you refer to it, you refer to it as something gross, uh, something low level. Um, I think that's a reflection from the new thought movement, which sort of gave matter uh, what we call matter, not what physicalism defines conceptually as what matter is, meaning uh, matter is that which can be exhaustively defined and described in terms of quantities alone and has no intrinsic qualities. That's the conceptual definition. I don't believe that definition is correct. In other words, there is nothing in nature that corresponds to that definition. But there is this thing we colloquially call matter, like this is a material bottle. It's made of metal. It's a kind of matter. So I would give myself license to use the word matter in this loose colloquial way. And I'm, I don't mean by it that I'm buying into the physicalism, physicalist story that matter is purely quantitative. So this thing we call matter has gotten a bad rap from the new thought movement. I, I see not only grossness in matter, I see unfathomable subtlety and nuance in matter. Matter is a fantastic thing, matter is the contents of perception. In other words, matter are the measurements on our dashboard. It's on the basis of that that we can not only survive, but it's on the basis of that that we relate to each other. And the world, our whole lives are funneled through this dashboard that we call matter or the screen of perception. Hooray to matter, <laughs> defined colloquially, if you know what I mean. Hooray to the dashboard of perception. Um, this is conducive to a form of experience that nature wouldn't have uh, otherwise. Um, I, I am with uh, Henri Corbin, for whom uh, matter was a symbol, an icon. A symbol is a better word because icon has gotten a bad rap as well. Uh, um, the whole world is a symbol. And what is a symbol? A symbol is something that does not embody its own meaning. It's pointing at something beyond itself. Now, if you are driving a car and you look at your speedometer, that needle moving in your speedometer, that's also a symbol. The number you read that's being pointed by the needle, say uh, 80 miles an hour, that's not the meaning of the thing in itself. That's pointing at something. In other words, it's pointing at the airspeed outside the car, the real thing, what really exists. Uh, in the same way, the dashboard of instruments we call matter or the screen of perception or the physical world it is pointing at something else behind it. It's pointing at its substance, that which stands beneath it, that which is on the other side of it from us, as um, uh, Owen Barfield put it, uh, that which is on the other side of the world from us. Uh, it, the whole world is pointing at it. The whole world is symbolic. Just like every dial on an instrument panel of an airplane has a meaning, it's pointing at something outside. It's pointing at air pressure outside, wind speed, humidity, whatever. Uh, so does the world around us point at something behind it, concealed by it, because that's how we evolved. We couldn't survive uh, uh, in any other way. Um, so I think matter is rich. 
Matter is profound. It's nuanced, subtle, it's not gross. Matter is a symbol towards transcendence. Hooray for matter. <laughs> Defined colloquially, you understand me, David. I hope. Yeah, yeah. If I if I could follow up, the, the I don't by gross. I don't mean. I mean, there's something like um. There's a there's a a boundary condition that we're that we're not we may not be perceiving the nuance of it. I, I think when I'm I'm curious about it. One of the things I was really interested in is your conversation with John Berbicki, the consciousness and what you said, meta consciousness. Almost everything that we think of as consciousness is properly in your frame meta consciousness. I believe. So that the underlying actual base level consciousness is something more of the essence of of the of, of all of all of existence. So I'm curious if there's something of our does our does our mind our mental interaction with with the world possibly afford additional nuance of exploration? That's what I'm really looking at. Oh yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, it, it has cost nature three and a half billion years to develop higher level mental functions in us things like uh, metacognitive introspection, which my cat doesn't have. My cat doesn't go into his own mind thinking, why am I feeling this way today? No, it doesn't do that. Um, and although that's also the origin of all suffering, that's the fall of man from the garden of paradise, when we realized that we were naked, that, that's right there. So you ate from the fruit of the tree of knowledge and then we become metacognitive. And we were expelled from paradise because by with this ability to introspect, we started questioning past and future. We started regretting the past and being anxious about the future. So we pay a huge price for it. But despite this price, or maybe precisely because of this huge price, I think we should focus on what we do gain from it. We are the part of nature, as far as we know, that is not merely instinctive. What Jung called consciousness, uh, mental activity driven by a will driven by deliberation that's placed within a, a, a web of interconnected meanings, a semantic web of cognitive associations. Um, I don't think the rest of nature can do that. I, think, I don't think the rest of nature can stick its head out of the instinctive flow of, of you know, its dynamics and say, oh, that's what's going on. That's what I'm doing to myself. I don't think it can do that, uh, except through us. Through us, it can do that. We are in a position to pass value judgments um, and other things are not. Maybe elephants are. Maybe cetaceans are. But it's not lot. It's not a lot. It, uh, it's a very small elite group in nature that has come to a position to pass value judgments to say this is good and that's not good. I want this and I don't want that. I mean, as the Old Testament shows in the Book of Job, you know, the God of the Old Testament is not capable of passing value judgments. He bungles the whole thing when it comes to that. It takes job to teach him <laughs> to pass value judgment on honesty, on, on morality, on decency, um, justice. Um, so I think we should focus on that uh, and not on the tremendous price we pay. Another thing that we can do is, you know, if we change our metaphysical narratives, because you know, the mind is the bouncer of the heart. If your mind rejects something as implausible or impossible, it doesn't sink into the body and you don't feel it. You don't get the insights that could come through it. And we are running this deadening narrative of mainstream physicalism today, which is basically telling us that, okay, this entire dashboard around us, all these needles, all these instruments, they're not measuring anything. It, they are their own meaning. Now picture that. Now picture you're in an airplane, you're looking at the instrument panel, you convince yourself that that's all there is to reality. Those needles are not measuring anything beyond themselves. They're not conveying information about anything beyond themselves. The world is that dashboard. No, it's claustrophobic. It eliminates the entire dimension of depth, meaning, uh, 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 and mystery uh, from the world. And that's deadening. And, and we are running this narrative. We are sort of deadening reality. Of course, reality is not affected by it, but our experience of it is. So we do a disservice uh, to ourselves. So uh, yeah, that two things I would recommend, you know, uh, look underneath the rug of this physicalist narrative. There's a lot of trash that has been swiped underneath and nobody wants you to see. Uh, and then that will be the starting point of uh, living through 
or living by a different narrative uh, regarding the world through different lenses. And that's that eliminates the deadening. And the other thing is, okay, we suffer. Let's accept that that's the price nature is paying through us. But what do we get for that price? And let's focus on that. I mean, ultimately, we are going to get out of this dashboard situation anyway. We are all going to die. So we don't need to be in a hurry. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't need to be a hur in a hurry to be the world again. So for as long as we can perceive the world as opposed to being the world, nature is getting a perspective that it otherwise wouldn't have through us. And no, we are going to go back to the matrix of being anyway. It's inevitable. You know? So I wouldn't be in a hurry about that. You know, take the suffering. It's going to end, hopefully, at some point. But take it as part of nature and make the best of this fantastic situation we are in, which is not to deny the, how incredibly hard it is. Yeah. Beautifully said. Uh, we have time for um, perhaps one more question, um, going to a quarter past. And um, uh, Hughes, you had a, a, an interesting question there in the chat, and if you wanted to ask it. Yeah, I was just asking, like, if if we see matter through, through a dashboard, um, how, how do we not people, how do people, like, between me or you or, or something, not perceive things in that, like a like in a different way or objects in a different way? How is it consistent for all of us? Because we are all immersed in the same world. There is a world that has standalone reality. It's not physical. Physical is just the measurement, the dashboard. But behind the dashboard, behind the measurement, there is a real world. I would say it's a world of mentation, a world of transpersonal, mental, or experiential states. Uh, but this world is there, and we are all immersed in it. So our respective dashboards are taking measurements from the same world in which we are immersed. So the measurement from our dashboards, if you account for some perspectival differences, because you're looking at it from a different angle or in your, you are in a, in a different location in it, um, if you account for these differences in perspective, our dashboards are consistent with one another because they are all measuring the same world surrounding us. That's why if you were sitting next to me, you would describe my study in a way very consistent to the way I describe it. It doesn't mean that the study as it appears on the screen of perception on the dashboard is the reality of the world as it is in itself. It is not. We can categorically say that now based on science. The screen of perception is an encoded inferential measurement mechanism, a kind of internal dashboard. Um, but whatever is actually the case about my study, whatever is the thing that appears to you and me as my study, if you were sitting here, it's common to you and me. We are both immersed in it. See what I mean? You can have two radar stations with their antennas trained at the same place. They will both give you consistent radar readings. But what they are reading, the, 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 the radar station, the radar, the radar screen, is not the reality. The reality is whatever is out there in the sky. The radar screen provides information about that. It makes a measurement about that. And because both radars are measuring the same thing, their images, their output is consistent. Therefore, we all agree that we are living in the same world, and we effectively are. It's just that this world is not physical. Physicality is defined by what in foundations of physics is called um, observable properties, the observables, things like la uh, mass, charge, momentum, spin. These are observables. And we know from quantum physics now that these observables are not there before measurement. Measurement doesn't just disclose what the observable properties were right prior to measurement. No, measurement brings the observable properties into existence. It's like, uh, which is very easy to understand. Uh, if you are sitting in an airplane on a dashboard, the needles are only pointing somewhere because there is something to be measured. Uh, but if you're not measurement, measuring anything, if you're not looking, the needles don't point anywhere. They go back to the, to the root of the dial, to point zero. So if physicality is the position of the needles, of course, it's only there if you measure. 
it's the position of the needles. The needles are not pointing anywhere unless you measure. But the thing measured is not physical, yet it's common to us all. We are all immersed in it. It's right under our noses. It's in contact with us, but we perceive that contact through a dashboard of dials. We don't see it as it is in itself. Brilliant. Renato, thank you for, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. This was really um, illuminating and, and a lot of fun as well. My pleasure. It usually, it usually takes a lot longer to try to make sense of these things, but at least uh, we've given a taste today. Yes, absolutely. I don't think we've cracked it. And I really encourage everyone to check out um, Bernardo's work and we'll, we'll, we'll send out links and, and include them as well. If, I'm, um, if I may add something, doing... Alexander, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, very please. quickly, and it's not yeah. a commercial ad because it's for free. We've just published at the Essentia Foundation's website, and even my own website has a link to that, a six hour long course in seven parts about analytic idealism in which I go in depth into all this. So if today we just whetted your appetite, have a look there either at my website, bernardocastruc.com or essentiafoundation.org. And you can just follow this course. It's for free. It's open for everyone. Beautiful. Sounds amazing. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for making that firstly. And then thanks for letting us know about it. And yeah, thanks everyone for your great questions. Uh, we'll see you. Uh, uh, well, we have Wisdom Gym tomorrow actually with Nicole Bradford. Um, so might, might see uh, you there. And uh, in, in Rebel Wisdom fashion, if we could unmute ourselves and say thank you to Bernardo and, and a goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Bernardo. Thank you. Thanks, Bernardo. <laughs> yeah.